For, for Tongans, like the connection to the land and your village is just huge, and everybody knows the village and land that they came from, but they can't see it. When I was flying today, I just was thinking about my dad, whose name is Devita. He got kidney failure about um, six or so years ago. Kidney failure for a person living in Tonga is a death sentence. Fortunately, my dad had a New Zealand citizenship. He was able to get dialysis, but at that very moment, dad could not come back to Tonga. That part of him had kind of died culturally, you know, the spirit, like, can't be on my island anymore. If we had Streetview then, Dad could go back to Tonga, he could have gone to Lavao, he could have looked at his land, he could have gone to the beach. If he had that, at the time that they said you can never go back to Tonga again, that would have kind of lessened the pain because he could return in, in a really cool platform like Google Street View. I know he'd be really proud of the work that we're doing. It's a gift in the first instance to our own people, our families, our friends, our cousins and our relatives, but it's also a gift to the world. So I think the story here is really that a lot of you are, are like Tanya, right? You have some story you want to tell. You have some impact that you want to drive for your local community. You have some reason that you know, maps are important. That's why you're here, right? And so um, all of these, it's just hard to follow this video, right? Like without some Kleenex or something to wipe your eyes. But um, yeah, all of these tools, all of these resources, if it can work there, right? If, if we can take all this stuff to a tiny island in the, in the South Pacific and do street view on dirt trails, like this can work for you. So I know it sounds implausible at first to think that we could ever have the entire world uh, in this virtual platform where anyone can come visit, right? To have every street mapped. Um, but if you think back 20 years, like we didn't have Google Earth. If you think back 10 years, there was no street view. Um, so this, this is evolving at such an amazing pace that together, there, there really is light at the end of the tunnel here. There is hope of finishing the map to digitize the entire world to let anybody go anywhere. Um, so with that, here are some resources for you. Um, so all of this info and more is at google.com slash streetview slash publish. And then we also have some programs for um, for borrowing some camera equipment for free, depending on your project and the market that you're in. Um, and that can be found at g.co slash trekker. Feel free to come chat later. I'm happy to talk more about any ideas that you might have or projects that you want to pursue. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So what we have coming up now is... Um, one of my personal favorite sessions or series of sessions, it's our partner talks. And this is when we turn it over to you guys and hear about the stories, the things that you have been, the stories you've been telling, the things that you've been doing with geospatial tools um, that we've been training a number of you uh, throughout the week. So I am really, really excited um, to host a number of speakers in our partner talk sessions. And kicking it off, will be Jeff Bolingbroke, Bolingbroke from Parks Canada. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Hi, everyone. All right, my name is Jeff Bolingbroke. I am a new media officer with Parks Canada. So Parks Canada is the federal agency in Canada. We're responsible for national parks, national historic sites, and national marine conservation areas. And we have been working with Google since 2013 to try to document uh, as many of our places and the fantastic places that we are lucky enough to manage uh, as we can. 
So in that time, we have managed at this point to uh, accumulate over 165 Parks Canada places. Uh, we're still working on that, so that number will be going up. Um, and we were able to take a look at the total number of kilometers that we, uh, uh, we collected with the Trekker. And the Trekker, of course, is the big backpack camera with the big bubble on your head and weighs a ton and is very challenging to move around, especially in difficult terrain, especially when you're going up mountains, which we have done. Um, so we have uh, accumulated, and this is the published um, number of kilometers. That's 3,381 kilometers. I apologize for uh, miles, people. I'm not 100% sure exactly what that is. Um, so one of the real benefits for, uh, for us is with working with Street View is that we have an opportunity to really bring uh, the parks to the people of Canada. And so we protect and present these places on behalf of all Canadians. And uh, we like to be able to find ways that if people are unable for one reason or another to actually get to some places, and there's some absolutely stunning, amazing places, I highly recommend everyone come and visit as much as you can. Um, but uh, if you're unable to get to these places, then we like to be able to find ways that we can sort of help to showcase these places for, for our Canadians. So uh, I wanted to show a couple of highlights here. Um, this is a highlight. So uh, this mountain here is called Mount Logan. It's the highest mountain in Canada. Um, that is me holding a trekker walking in front of it. I was lucky enough to be able to actually hitchhike a ride on a plane that is able to land onto this glacier. So it's the St. Elias ice fields. In, this is in the Yukon territories in uh, northern, northwestern Canada. Stunning place. So uh, we'll just do a quick highlight reel, I guess, of some of the more difficult, challenging places that we've been able to, uh, to bring to, to the world. Um, so in the top left, uh, we've got Guayanas National Park. And this is an archipelago uh, islands off of the west coast of Canada and northwest coast. Beautiful old growth uh, rainforest and really deserted beaches, as you can see here, and also uh, in indigenous sites from a long time ago. Um, further off to the right, we've got uh, Natsi Cho National Park uh, that's in the Northwest Territories. And this place basically has no trails or much park infrastructure at all. So we were able to uh, just go and start climbing up some mountains and showing people what, uh, what the wilderness in that area looks like. And we've got uh, Nahani National Park, that's Virginia Falls. It is absolutely gigantic. Um, and then we've also done some multi-day backpacking trips. Uh, so we've got the West Coast Trail, which is the person climbing the ladder there. Ladders are tricky, holding onto a trekker. And then we've also done the Chilkoot Trail, which is between Alaska and the Yukon Territories. Absolutely phenomenal. And I think our biggest claim to fame at this point is we've also been to Quetinerpak National Park, which is on Ellesmere Island, which is just a little bit shy of the North Pole. And uh, here's a video to uh, show you what that looks like. So, uh, thank you. Quatinder Park, uh, Quatinder Pack, sorry, National Park. Uh, Quatinder Pack actually translates to top of the world. So that really was uh, the top of the world. And it's actually, at least at the time of it being published, that was the furthest north point that Street View uh, had had visited, so that was pretty exciting. Um, so all of the places that we have uh, published on Street View are available on the Parks Canada website. Um, so we have a Street View section, um, and if you take a look at this place, I highly encourage you to come and take a look at all of our content that we publish. But uh, 
these are, this is a list of the places where we have visited, and it's all segmented by, um, by province and territory. And you can take a look, and that will link you on to, let's see where we go. This is uh, Nahani National Park in the Northwest Territories. It's a place called the Cirque of the Unclimbables. I was lucky enough to actually be the one carrying the trekker in this area. Um, not so much in the way of trails, just uh, a lot of boulders to scramble around on, which is really stunning. Um, as you can see, it's quite amazing. Uh, this tower, you can see there's a rock face up here. Uh, people climb that. There were some climbers on there when we shot this. You can't see them because they're teeny, teeny, tiny, but it's, uh, it's called the Lotus Flower Tower. People come from all over the world to, uh, to go climbing in this area, but it's very inaccessible, very difficult to get to. We hope that we're able to actually bring this to, uh, to more people. And uh, with that, I think I will open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, right, sorry, I forgot. There's my trucker selfie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now for questions. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, don't look We need the we need to do the throw. <laughs> We're not going to throw the box this time. <laughs> I'm just wondering how far you could go in a day. I mean, you said it was 40 pounds, so I'm thinking, this is heavy, you know, you're not probably getting very far. Did it depend on the terrain or the location of? Absolutely, logistics are certainly a, a challenge and it depends on the terrain and it depends on where we are. We always travel in, uh, in pairs at minimum, if not more. Uh, we try to switch off for every couple of hours if we can. Um, we try to maintain radio contact with the other person but not be walking side by side because then that face will be in every single image as you, as you go along. And uh, the batteries uh, with the Trekker will last six, seven hours, something like that. So sometimes if it's a multi-day backpacking trip, we need to carry extra batteries, we need to carry battery chargers, we need to carry all sorts of extra stuff. So there's a lot of extra challenging things. The lucky part that we have is that we have a fantastic staff across the entire country who are really, really familiar with these places. And they are just an absolute asset for being able to plan these kind of uh, excursions. So we're, we're really heavily reliant on the people who know the area very, very well. So just to follow up on that, about your support staff, are they like always hiding behind boulders while you're walking? <laughs> we, <laughs> or are they we, far uh, behind? Like, how does that work? <laughs> it changes t terrain based. Uh, so, in a deep, heavy rainforest with a trail that's got a lot of curves, it's really easy to find a tree to hide behind, and then you can just kind of sneak up on the person. Uh, when you're up in the high alpine and there's just bushes or nothing, then you know you just have to walk further away from each other. Do you know if the uh, resources are being used in the parks themselves as far as, uh, you know, do you know of any projects that people are using the resources for outside of just finding them and being able to visit? Absolutely. Yeah. So we, our team, so the, the, the sort of national group of new media that we work with, we've uh, produced five expeditions programs, which can be used by teachers and schools. And uh, we've done it. We've done outreach projects uh, bringing those kind of uh, VR viewers to, to people walking by in uh, various uh, festivals and, and things like that. Um, and, and also, we have it embedded on different websites. We're able to sort of show highlights of different places. And uh, we're always looking for new and exciting ways to kind of showcase that, that imagery as much as we can. I think we have time for Thanks. one more quick question. Great. I was wanting to follow up on that. Is there uh, experiences that you've been able to bring in and annotate and tell more of the stories behind the things that people are seeing in the Street View images? Are there things on the horizon that you're going to be sharing with Canadians uh, from all this incredible imagery? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Expeditions is a really good example. So it gives us a chance to show a 360 image. Everyone's got their VR viewers on. And then a teacher can kind of, uh, we, we provide some content. So there's a little bit of uh, enrichment uh, in information about the, the location that we're looking at. You can pinpoint points of interest and say, this particular, well, this mountain here is a place where people climb. It's uh, 1,000 vertical meters to climb up, um, and it takes 24 hours, basically, from your tent to the top, rappelling back down. 
and around. So we can kind of show people that, and we can also provide the, those tools to the, to the teachers um, so that they don't have to be experts, but they can appear to be experts to their, to their students. Are we good? Thank you very Thanks, much, everyone. Jeff. Thank you. So I have a question. What gets the, what gets the most sore, Jeff, after carrying the, uh, after carrying the Street View Trekker for so many hours? What gets the most sore, your lower back or your? Shoulders. Absolutely. Absolutely, it's the shoulders. There's a lot of weight pulling straight down on the shoulders. And as uh, John Bailey said in, uh, earlier today, it's, it was not really designed with the most amount of padding. So it's, uh, it's an external frame backpack. So you're excited it's for heavy. the next generation. It's heavy. The lighter version. Yeah, very. <laughs> um, so next up, I want to welcome Christoph Bayash, who's the co-founder of Underwater Earth. Um, where we're going to dive beneath the surface of the water with Street View. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here this week amongst so many inspiring people and uh, leaders of so many incredible projects, all trying to make a difference um, in this world. So it's great for us to be able to give you a bit of a glimpse into our own journey underwater. So <clears throat> when we um, set up Underwater Earth as a charity in Australia in 2011, ocean awareness was extremely low. Not many people really cared about the ocean you know, its importance, its issues. And so very early on, we realized that, you know, one of the, probably the greatest threat facing the ocean um, is the fact that it is completely out of sight and out of mind. I'd like to do a quick show of hands, if you don't mind. How many of you have ever scuba dived? Wow, okay. So that might actually throw out my statistics a little bit. <laughs> uh, I wasn't prepared for that. but. The reality is that, believe it or not, 99% of people have never dived, and may never will. So then we ask ourselves, you know, how can you possibly get people to love and therefore protect an environment that you know, they've never seen um, and not understand? And at the same time, talking about coral reefs here, um, you know, we were learning that somewhere between 40 to 50% um, of coral reefs had disappeared uh, over the previous 40 years. So what we decided to do was to bring the uh, magnificence and vulnerabilities of the ocean and coral reefs into the public eye um, urgently and on a large scale. And really, what, you know, what better way to uh, bring the ocean to the world um, than to do it the way Google does it so well on land, taking Google Street View underwater. Um, and that's exactly what we did. In 2011, um, two colleagues and I invented a revolutionary camera called the SV2 um, that allowed us to capture GPS-tagged full 360-degree panoramic images underwater um, and produce virtual dives at scale. Take, from a technology standpoint, you know, making it short, it wasn't that easy to come up with a system that was very robust to go on very far and, and difficult expeditions and being able to capture imagery that, uh, you know, in, in very low light conditions and in motion. Um, but nevertheless, in less than three months, we managed to pull it off and the camera was born. And the video that I'm about to show you is, um, you know, how we launched this project alongside uh, with Google.
So thanks to um, our collaboration with Google, our imagery has become the most viewed underwater imagery of all time. In fact, more people went virtually diving in the first couple of months of the launch of the project than have ever dived in person. Quite powerful. Um, and so since the beginning of our journey, we've been to more than 30 countries and collected over a million of these underwater 360 images. In fact, some of these expeditions were with uh, some of the guys here from the Google Outreach team, Riley, Karen, De um, Brian, and Tomomi in many parts of the world where we were basically bringing an unknown world to the Trekker Collect and bringing the underwater aspect to really complete the full picture. Um, and so this is a screen grab from the, the latest um, Google Earth layer where we recently migrated about 140 um, of our virtual dives um, into it um, three or four days ago. So for those who didn't raise their hand early on, um, that's a great time to go virtual dive at your leisure after this session. So at the core of what we do is produce you know, very immersive and powerful imagery that tells story. In this instance, one of the biggest coral in the world, nicknamed Big Mama in American Samoa. Um, but you know, that's not all. Um, our imagery uh, you know, also carry important scientific data. When we go out on expedition, we capture thousands and thousands of these imagery, and each and single one of them is GPS located, which means that we can go back to the same place, revisit these environments when you know, a, a cyclone has hit or a coral bleaching even um, has happened, and monitor the changes over time. And that's actually why we partner with scientists from the University of Queensland and Excel Kathleen to launch the Excel Kathleen CV survey, effectively creating a global baseline of coral reefs. And the output of this five-year-long program is the largest uh, open source database of um, scientific imagery. And you know, talking about how imagery can, can be a powerful tool to uh, understand uh, what's going on in this environment, especially underwater, um, you know, this, this image you know, says it all. We uh, went in this exact same location three times in American Samoa to witness a healthy reef at the end of 2014, which turned completely bleached um, a few months later, early, early February um, 2015, and died in, in a few months later again um, in 2015. Um, the good news, though, is that actually uh, last month, uh, some of the scientists that went to uh, reserve at this area have just told us that uh, this reef is, is slowly but uh, recovering. So the other um, aspect of the work that we do um, is education. It's really, really key to the work we do. Um, so our underwater panoramic imagery has been used to take the ocean into the classroom. Um, we've you know, using Google Expeditions. And whenever we go out on, on remote expedition or anywhere we go, we try to really connect with the local school to get the local kids to come and experience this content. And I must say, it's quite a, an incredible and humbling experience to, to see their reaction when they see their local reef just where they live for the first time. We've also produced numerous uh, Voyager stories that you can uh, interact with. Um, and more recently, we've uh, expanded our VR repertoire into producing and directing 360 VR films. The like of Out of the Blue, which is a very um, profound and inspiring story of uh, fishermen from a, a place called Cabo Pulmo in the southern part of Mexico um, that have turned eco-warriors to protect their own reefs. And uh, actually narrated by uh, Sylvia Earle. And that's the sort of work we do more and more. So to conclude with this very, very curious snapper, um, you know, Google has been a, an integral part of, of our work over the last six years, and it's, it's really exciting to, um, to explore how their work can help us you know, improve our work uh, to uh, connect and reconnect more and more and more people with the ocean. And with every one of you here in this room, it will be a great opportunity to catch up and perhaps you know, talk about meaningful collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe. We have uh, a couple minutes for any questions.
Thank you. That was amazing. Um, a very basic question. How, how does the GPS work underwater? Great question. <laughs> Um, we, tried, we tried a few things, but in fact, we followed um, advice from scientists, and the way they do it is quite simple. Um, we put a GPS into a, a waterproof pouch, and we trail it behind us. So there's always you know, a, a set distance uh, between the camera and the actual GPS, um, but so it's not precisely above the camera, but it's a, a certain amount of distance behind. And that's the way to do it, because obviously underwater, it's just a complete nightmare. So it, it wouldn't be accurate, and it'll be, yeah, very difficult to do. I'm assuming that when you do your uh, filming, you're piggybacking on top of some other kind of research project or something. Do you find it difficult to do, take the street view and complete your tasks as well, or is it okay? Um, sorry, what do you mean exactly? You mean, ex are there existing projects that are similar that we... Com it we sounded like you were doing, um, you were taking samples and monitoring different sites and yep. collecting scientific data. Was it difficult to do both the filming and taking... Not sure. Um, I mean, really, the, there's, there's two aspects of the work we do. One is scientific, as you pointed out, uh, where we follow, you know, a very um, uh, given transect uh, out of same depth, um, you know, using the same tool, et cetera, so you can monitor every time you go somewhere or you can actually compare this data with many other uh, places around the world. <clears throat> the other type of imagery, which is more the engaging imagery, is done in between. Uh, you know, we, <clears throat> we select a certain site that we feel are iconic that we want to reveal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, for this, we don't need scientific, um, if you like, tools, the like of, uh, you know, temperature logger that we otherwise carry, um, you know, uh, altitude, um, uh, tools to measure altitude, um, and so forth. Okay, thank you very much, Christophe. Thank you. So we've gone high into the Cirques of Canada with Jeff underwater with Christophe, and then now we're going into the area where Jane Goodall did her historic research in Gombe, Tanzania, with Dr. Lindian Pintea, who is the VP of Conservation Science at the Jane Goodall Institute. Thank you. Most of the world, biodiversity is under the care of indigenous people or local communities. Some estimates are that this is figure is as high as 80% or even more. And this is also true for chimpanzees. Their future depends of local people, such as this private forest owner in Uganda. Or like in Tanzania, where Jane started her research back in 1960, 86% of chimpanzees are outside protected areas. When Jane went to Gombe back in 1960, she immediately recognized the importance of local communities and engaged them into the research, into chimpanzee research. And a few years later, uh, in the mid 80s, she realized that there is no hope for this studied chimpanzees if local communities are not part of the solutions and if people's livelihoods are not addressed. By 2001, this is a satellite image from National Geographic published using Icono satellite imagery, the first one collected of Gombe in high resolution. The world could see, everyone could see that Gombe is a habitat island. And in 2005, with support of USAID and technical partners, including Google Earth Outreach, we start encouraging people to develop land use plans that may be better work for both people and chimpanzees. By 2009, local communities, village by village, set aside these village forest reserves independently, and these reserves have been connected to each other, to Gombe, and to the larger chimpanzee areas outside the park, all the way to Burundi, along the ridge. Now, 
I encourage you to look at the Voyager, our Voyager story of Gombe, Jane, and chimpanzees to experience and learn more about how, we, how this happened. Um, and also to have a look at it yourself at some of these forest patches. For example, this is um, in a village how it looked in 2005. You can see this is Kilgali village. You can see the farms and the eroded streams and, and the eroded landslides on the right. Um, and this is how this village looks like in 2014, and it's improving. You can also zoom in and take a street view and see how some of this forest look like in street view compared to above. So looking back at some of these achievements and wondering about how technology played a role in converting data and information into action, you know, a couple of insights come to my mind, and I only have for a few, I only have maybe for three, time for three. One of them is the importance of empowering local communities. And this can take many different forms. For example, in Kibale National Park, a protected area ranger used Forest Watcher mobile app, was able to see that there is this deforestation alerts from weekly GLAD alerts, which looks here in pink, and this uh, uh, pink squares. He was able to use the app, visit, confirm, collect the data, and read that this is inside the park. And then, because Uganda Wildlife Authority has the capacity, the mandate, and also resources to engage in good relationship with local communities, they are able to engage and resolve this issue, that no encroachment should happen inside the park. Now, as of January 2018, we can confirm that actually this is happening. The community of new farms are outside the protected areas exactly along the border with Kibale National Park. Amazing. Now, the same Forest Watch mobile app and technology in the hands of a local community forest monitor is equally powerful and effective in finding the location of the forest alerts, locating them, reporting them, taking pictures. However, the social reality of converting this data, supporting and developing this data, and converting it into, into action, it's much more different than just a few kilometers away in, in a protected area. And it's really important to be aware of these realities, about the importance of not only providing access to a mobile device, uh, power, electricity, um, internet, uh, training, multiple trainings, and even transportation, or even to compensate for the time lost, which otherwise they don't have to put uh, bread on a table for their families, this has to be part of the technology process and development in order to be effective, to turn pixels and data into positive action. Another insight is the importance of truly be compassionate to other perspectives and values. Yes, um, we have satellites, we can see the trees, but what is really important sometimes are things which are not seen. These are some of the sacred sites, which, you know, it's interesting. But now looking back at 20 years of work with local communities, guess what? The places where forests are doing the best are around the places which have sacred sites. So they might be unseen, but they are real, and they do shape real landscapes. A few months ago, I had a chance to visit the Kigali village, which is our stellar uh, performer in terms of reforesting the forest. And we sit down around this amazing digital globe satellite imagery in 2000, comparing the village from 2005 and 2017. Community members immediately were able to proudly show the changes, the positive changes in forests and streams. It was truly amazing to, to see this. But what came out during this discussion is that one critical part of how this information and technology actually end up in that positive change which you just saw was actually the role of the local leadership, of the village chairman who, after all the participatory process and mapping, went and visited each farmer and asked for their support to move their farm in order to get these benefits from protecting watersheds for the entire community. And I was wondering how he managed to do it. And for example, the woman on the left was pointing out where her farm used to be. And now she has to walk one more hour to get 
to the new farm, which is outside the forest reserve. I couldn't help asking her, was it worth it? And she said, you see, this, is, this house, that is a school. And you see that stream which is eroded in 2005 because of deforestation. One day, my kids were in the school. It was a flash flood which almost destroyed that school. I better work, walk another one hour, but my children are safe. So truly powerful, and again, seeing how imagery and data did facilitate it and guided the process, but the leadership and the power of local communities and they own discussions how what is the better for their livelihoods was so critical. So I just want to add you with one thought. You know, in the last 30 years with conservation biology, I'm by training conservation biologists, our assumption was that the best thing we can do since science and technology is separate from the social process of decision making is for us to leave our codes in the, in the lab, go to the field and really listen to what the needs are of decision makers and go back in the lab and come out with solutions and deliver the solutions to them. Well, I think now we realize that we can do, this is important, but we should do more. And I know that many of you in, the, in, in this audience are already doing that and I just want to leave you with this encouragement. I think it's time for us to think about the science and technology process, not as separate, but as part of this complex, you know, very specific decision-making processes at multiple scales, sometimes at the village, sometimes at the regional scales, sometimes at the global scales, and we need to be part from the beginning, bringing this technology and powerful tools for, um, to support decision-making. And this will help us secure a future for both people, chimpanzees and other biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. I think we have time for one or two quick questions. Ah. Um, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Um, and I thought it was really fascinating to see what has happened over the years, uh, you know, since 1960 that Dr. Goodall, you know, landed in Gombe. I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the most compelling incentive for those community dwellers to really be a part of this conservation process for the chimpanzees? Uh, and would you say that this is something that they have been able to successfully transfer through at least about one or two generations so far? Mm -hmm. Or is, are the youths really diverging away from the inclination of their parents? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was waiting for the microphone. Um, thank you for, the, uh, for this question. Um, so, like many parks in, in Africa, Gombe National Park follows the boundaries of a colonial for a reserve, which generated a lot of conflict in the, in, past, in the past, starting with 1940s and 50s and 60s. So the memory of local people about protected area was that this is not our land. And when I started working at Gombe in 2000, you could hear that, ah, you know, this is, you know, this is Gombe's land. Um, but I think the point when the, the, it, it, it was a shift in perception was when we started doing land use plans and encouraging people to map the boundaries of the village and secure the land tenure. So having that security that this land is, is um, it's, it's in their hands was really, really important. Another part, important incentive was, as I show in this case, is security. Security from flash floods, security from erosion, security from access to um, agriculture fields which provide uh, food for their families, and security for being able to better manage those natural resources for, for themselves as well, for other um, uh, needs. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, it's always wonderful to hear about your work. Um, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have such speakers who have such um, breadth of knowledge and understanding about the products or the, the tools and the work that they've been doing all over these, you know, over the, the course of the years that they've been working on it. They're around.